Why should you read the Mythigo Wood Cycle by Robert Holdstock? This is a fantasy series recommended by Peter F. Hamilton, a writer of both Heart and Fire, he says. Guy Gavriel Kay, Rob Holdstock is one of the voices at the very heart of modern fantasy. David Gemmell, Rob Holdstock is a wonderful writer. Uh, it's, yeah, Kim Stanley Robinson says that this book, at least, is a beautiful evocation of the wilderness. I found the final movement sublime and exhilarating. Uh, this book is introduced by Neil Gaiman, and on the back you've also got Michael Moorcock saying this is the outstanding fantasy book of the 1980s. That big names, big company. Rob Holdstock was, I mean, he, he was not a writer of the first rank in fame. Um, he did win things like the World Fantasy Award um, and uh, I think some other minor awards for particularly for Mythgo Wood. He published just before his death, the last in this series, The Villion. There are, I think, yeah, depending on the listing you go for, there are seven books. There are basically, and what that really means is five novels and uh, a novella and some short stories that are related. Or possibly two novellas, one of the short stories might be long, I, I, I forget. These are the five novels. I've read uh, much of this series, I've not read all of it yet. Uh, it's one I, I am getting through. He is a really interesting writer. He's he's British. Uh, he wrote initially kind of part work and bit work um, under other names and then kind of blew the scene apart with a book, uh, an award-winning book, which is very, very strange. And Mythgo as a whole se series is very, very strange. I'll read the blurb on this one just for the sake of kind of giving a sense of what's going on. Deep within the wildwood lies a place of myth and mystery from which few return and of those few, none remain unchanged. Stephen Huxley has already lost his father to the mysteries of Ripewood on his return to the Second World, from the Second World War. He finds his brother Christopher is also enthralled to the mysterious Wildwood, wherein lies a realm where mythic archetypes grow flesh and blood, where love and beauty haunt your dreams, and in promises of freedom lies the sanctuary of insanity. Uh, I'll read, I'll read the, because this one doesn't spoil anything else, I'll read this as well. Ryup Wood, Mythigo Wood, is the great forest steeped in mystery whose heart contains secrets that change all who come there. Alex Bradley is a damaged and visionary child. Little does he know that the distorted creations of his mind are alive inside nearby Ryup Wood. When the forest claims him, his father goes in pursuit along with a scientific expedition looking for the secret of Mythago Genesis. But inside Ryup... Alex has created a hundred forms of the trickster, all of them seeking their maker, and all of them deadly. So it, it's a sort of, it's small scale fantasy. It's about families, particularly parents and children. Um, it's about uh, wilderness. It's about England. It is a kind of fantastic English wood and about the people who get sucked into it. It's sometimes, as in The Hollowing, which is the third novel, and Mythago Wood, it is about science almost, and it, about the way that folklore is created. It's pseudoscience in, I mean, literally it is, but more to the point is, for Holstock, he is using a really cleverly wrought scientific device as a way of discussing the folk memory of folklore, um, and the way in which, in the wood, the wood which is much larger on the inside than on the outside, all these things remain, and more, more things that perhaps have warped beyond our typical idea of, of folklore. It is, of course, the dark fairy tales that are most important plot-wise very often, not always. So, what is good about these about these books? Uh, the, the novels are Myth Go Wood, Love on This, these are both in Fantasy Masterworks, The Hollowing, Merlin's Wood, which is set in a French forest, which essentially Pratchett, Pratchett L space wise is kind of a similar sort of thing to Ripe Wood, Ancient Oak Wood, and Avillion. These are beautifully written. He's a really fine writer. Uh, there are very, I mean, when Robinson talks about the end of this being sublime and exhilarating, that's Lavondis. It is one of the most sublime, exhilarating conclusions to something. It's incredibly strange. And complex um, not not too difficult for you to understand or anything but it's it's dense um, and intense and it's not a story about a character going on a quest to defeat the Dark Lord and what difficulties they find there and 
and so on. There may be sometimes plots that relate to things like that, but really there's a journey of discovery, a seeking of family and of the self in Riot Wood, uh, which is the kind of, that's what I mean, it's a small scale adventure, small scale fantasy uh, that uses these other devices to investigate that. I think when Robinson says a beautiful evocation of the wilderness, both in England and in us, um, I think that's it. not a bad way to think about the way the what the writing evokes is this um, constant, heavily descriptive and beautiful um, kind of image of of this strange forest world. Let's see. I'm just going to more or less flick at random and see if I can find something that looks okay and uh, like hasn't is not spoilery, but also uh, is is beautiful. Yeah, uh, just re being reminded as I go here uh, of the odd, strange plots. He had fought against his father and been banished to a place where there was no true stone. He was alone in the strange land except for the hunting. He hunted with weapons of bone and ash and polished obsidian. He rode wild horses. He ran with hounds that were as tall as the neck of a horse. His bone-tipped spears impaled salmon whose scales were fashioned from silver. To travel far in this world of mad creation, he was carried in the talons of an owl. His need to return to the place of his birth became overwhelming, but there was no way back for him, and though he rode north and south along the great gorge, and found caves and ancient tombs through which a strange wind blew, he could not escape the dream. He would lay out of reach, his world lay out of reach. He tied his white standard to the antlers of an elk and rode on the beast's back, but when it reached the high mountains, it shook him off. That is, that's actually a story, that's a story someone's telling someone, uh, so it has a slightly more uh, mythic, folklore style, but that, that ability for evocative, quite dense, terse description is, you know, continued throughout. Really beautifully written, really evocative, I've kind of touched on that, and that is the writing's evocative, it's very pretty, and that does evoke, um, it's evocative of two things, the Mythical Wood series, it's evocative of uh, this inner England. If you if you read your uh, certainly your Lord of the Rings uh, or Neil Gaiman, often I'm thinking about something like Neverwhere, um, is a good example of that, of these inner Englands. Whether in Neverwhere's case, a kind of mythic city, uh, or in Lord of the Rings, the Shire, particularly being a mythic countryside. And there are others. I mean, Moorcock. When you when you look at um, Melibene, that is a a mythic England from a much more cynical perspective. Um, this is a mythic England which emphasises wildness and mystery and uh, the social density of the place as well. In that sense, you can see it. And that's, it's very evocative of that kind of both the wilderness and also, therefore, of an implied people, an implied population, uh, which I think is, is really well observed. And it's very, very evocative of the human psychological and emotional state. Um, there are very few writers who write... Um, visionary breakdowns as well as hold stock and mystical experiences very very powerful uh, and the, as i said i can't think of very many people who write them like that you think about other great character writers many many great character writers out there today joe abercrombie an obvious example of of one um kim stanley robinson another one very different writers to each other of course but not in neither of those as examples and um, the interiority um, even when it's at its most subtle and intelligent, um, is very rarely intense in the, in the way that I'm talking about and thinking about here. Not even like Logan Nine Fingers at his most kind of angsty and deep um, has the strange hypnotic quality where you feel like you're really seeing inside someone. Albeit you have to cope with the fact that it's strange, often mystical, because people are strange and often mystical. I think, yeah, also the way he deals with family relationships um, and the kind of psychology and sociology of those is, is really powerful and interesting. Um, and I guess actually the thing, England, the living history of a kind of England where he writes from um, the, the 40s into the 60s, 70s. Uh, I, I, you know, the generation above him really, he's, he's writing about the world he grew up in as it aged out um, into his own early adulthood, I guess, uh, which I think is an interesting a decision to make and you know very often you find that in uh, Susan Cooper's Dark is Rising cycle the sense of this writing about this world slightly in the past as something the author is reflecting upon and processing for themselves and in that case again that is a mythic England cycle 
uh, or Mythic England and Wales. Yeah, so that's why I'd recommend this if you like juicy, uh, evocative writing, psychological intensity, creation, uh, just the sheer number of weird and wonderful things you find in the wood. Uh, sometimes real tension actually and uh, and stress <laughs> um, and an evocative of wilderness that is, is uh, as with the psychology is unmatched I would virtually unmatched I would highly recommend the mythic wood cycle tough to say in some ways how, how to read them basically I think there probably is a preferred reading order but in one way there is only one pair of true sequels by that I mean something where you directly pick up on some characters and some things that have happened at strictly in the previous uh, book that's connected, which is the first and the seventh book, Mythico Wood and Avilion. But there are links throughout, and there are recurring characters throughout. And so though it is a cycle rather than a series, you don't have Randall Thor going on his quest at the beginning and then at the end he does whatever he does. Um, this is nonetheless one that I think, barring Merlin's Wood and some of the short stories at least, is best read basically in publication order. Mythico Wood, Lavondis. Uh, the Hollowing and Avilion and fit in. There's a prequel novella. Um, for instance, you could fit that in anywhere or before. Uh, is that Shadow? Is that Forest of Bone? Gate of Bone? It's Vibrin. Let me have a check um, what the other two are called. Gate of Ivory, Gate of Horn is one. Uh, so, yeah, I recommend reading basically in. Uh, and the Bone Forest is another. I'd recommend reading in publication order apart from the novellas which can be slotted in wherever um, and uh, I think generally speaking people really like Avilion to be fair uh, from what I've seen some people really like the novellas most people think Lavondis is the best of the cycle Moorcock uh, would go for Mythigo Wood um, and these two are certainly the one reason they're, they're in fancy masterworks is they are the best regarded in general and I guess possibly also the rights are available uh, you know, I don't know so yes, I'd, I'd go through it that way, and if you're, th on the other hand, if you're thinking you only want to read one and the best one, and I'm never going to read any others, probably most people would recommend Lavondis. Anyway, that is why I would recommend reading The Mythical Wood Cycle. If you've read it, tell me what you thought of it in uh, the comments, add any reasons I have missed, and other recommendations for mythic fantasy, like myth fantasy and um, psychologically interior fantasy. Put them in the comments. Till next time.